Shalom. Today we're going to look at some more small words with similar letters. We're looking at words that are based on shin mem and sin mem. And since the fewer are with the sin, we'll start there. So there is a root, sin vav mem, it's a verb root, that means to put in place or to set something. Sometimes we see it sin yud mem, and in modern Hebrew we only use the yud. But in Biblical Hebrew you will see both. Genesis 4.15 And Yehovah said unto him, Therefore, whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And Yehovah set Yasem, a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And the other form appears we see in Genesis 30.42 But when the cattle were feeble, he put Yasim, them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Now when we're looking in the past tense, we don't really have any problem. Genesis 13, 16. And I will make Samti. It conjugates just like any normal hollow verb. Your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. The third person masculine singular appears in Genesis 30, 41. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid, he put in place, some, the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. So when you are dealing with this verb, it will always have the sin, it will never have the shin. So we just want to be aware which side is the dot on. The right is sh, shin, and the left is sin, because remember, sin is never right. Moving along to the words that do have the shin, the most basic is sham, and it means there, over there in that place. Genesis 2.12 And the gold of that land is good. There is bedelium and the onyx stone. In Genesis 2.8, we see both words side by side. And Yehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there, Sham, he put, Bayasem, with the sin, the man whom he had formed. There is another word that without the vowel, you would never know which word you're looking at, and that is Shem. So Sham is going to have a, a kamat, the little T-shape. Shem is going to have the two dots. Genesis 2.11. The name, Shem, of the first is Pison, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there, Sham, in that place, is gold. And you probably already know this word Shem. Uh, many people will not say the four-lettered name of God. They just say Hashem. Hashem means the name. Genesis 3.20, and Adam called his wife's name Shem, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now, even though Shem is a masculine noun, it takes a feminine plural. And there are a lot of this sort of irregular words in Hebrew. Genesis 2.20, And Adam gave name, Shemot, to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. Can you imagine how brilliant Adam was that he thought up all the names for all the different animals? Shemot, you probably already know, is the book of Exodus. So when we talk about Exodus in English or Latin or Greek, we're talking about the exit of them going out of Egypt, which is mostly what the book is about. But in Hebrew, the names of the Bible books are for the first main word in the text. And the book of Exodus begins, Ele Shemot. These are, not an important word, Shemot, the names, the names of the people who went down. Now, if Shem, as name, had a normal masculine ending, it would look like this. But this is a different word, and it has different vowels, and this is Shemayim, which means the heavens. And it's variously translated in the singular and the plural. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 2.1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, Shemayim because Sham, there, Mayim, that's where the water is. So we come into a peculiar situation when we are talking about the construct. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Smichut. And this is how possession is formulated. 
So looking at the heavens of the heavens, we have Psalm 148.4. Praise him, you heavens of heavens. That's Shmei. The Shmei is the construct form. It's missing the final mem. Hashemayim, the heaven of heavens, and you waters that be above the heavens. Another example is from Lamentations 366. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of Yehovah. So we see the construct form Shmei attached to the name of the Lord. Again, we have this interchangeable translation, whether it's plural or singular. Deuteronomy 10.14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens, Shmei HaShemayim. It's Shmei and Shemayim are the same word. They're just in the form of the construct where you have two nouns leaning one on the other. Shmei HaShemayim is Yehovah's your God. The earth also with all that therein is. So there, there's a singular attached to a plural, but it's just the same word. It's just somebody made a decision in translation to make it either heaven singular or heavens plural. Again, 1 Kings 8.27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens, Shmei HaShemayim, cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built, a prayer of Solomon. Now, if you look at that form, Shmei, you can see that it looks like something else. It looks like the word for name, Shem, plus the personal pronoun for my. And we see this in several places. Genesis 48:16, The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads and let my name Shmi. The heavens of is Shmei. This is Shmi. Be named on them. And the name, Shem, of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Again in Exodus 6, 3. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Shmi, Yehovah, was I not known to them. I know this can be a little challenging, a little confusing, because the words look the same, but you have the same problem even in English, where words are spelled the same, they sound the same, but they have completely different meanings. For example, the word cleave, C-L-E-A-V-E. Are you going to cling to that person, or are you going to take a huge knife and rend them in two? Both meanings are for the same word. So how do we decide by context always? Now if the heavens are belonging to somebody, it will be easy to distinguish, except in the case of my. It turns out that there is no my heaven in the Bible, so you don't have to worry about looking for that. But we'll see right now. If it is your heaven, Deuteronomy 28.33, and your heaven, Shamech, that is over your head, shall be brass, and the earth that is under you shall be iron. What if it's your name? Genesis 12.2. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name, Shmecha, great, and you will be a blessing. So we can see in the writing, in the spelling of the word, that the heavens, because they are a plural in Hebrew, will maintain the yud before adding. We can see that the suffix for your, singular, second person, is the same. But before we add it, in the heavens, the heavens are plural, there's a yud. But in the name, the name is singular, there's no yud. Here is an example of the third person, masculine, singular, his. Deuteronomy 33:28, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine, and his heavens, Shamav, shall drop down dew. So when we have a plural noun with the personal possessive noun for his, we add a vav, but the vav follows the yud because the noun is plural. In Genesis 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. This is Shemo, Shem. And then we get the O that you might expect for his because the noun is singular. For God, said she, has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And in terms of the heavens belonging to somebody, this was the last example I could find. 
Leviticus 26, 19. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven, Shmechem. We see the Yud because the heaven is plural in Hebrew, whether you translate it in English, heaven or heavens in Hebrew, it's plural. It's really dual, but it's plural. And so the Yud appears before the suffix indicating the person. In this case, it's a second person plural. And I will make your heaven, Shmechem, as iron and your earth as brass. When we come to the name, we see Isaiah 65, 5. And you shall leave your name, Shemchem, for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord Yehovah shall slay you and call his servants by another name. There's no Yud because the noun Shem is singular. And then we just add the suffix for belonging to all y'all. I have to say all y'all in at, at least one time in every video. Okay, now we're going to get into some really deep. There is a root it's a geminate root that means the same letter is there twice shamam which means to make desolate or to destroy and because it's a geminate we don't always see both of the mems in a noun or even a conjugated verb so the singular for astonishment or desolation is shama and we see it in psalm 46 8 which we've been studying psalm 46 and that's how this presentation developed Come, behold the works of God. What desolations he has made in the earth. So Shema is a feminine. It takes a feminine plural, Shamot. It's not Shemot, names. It has a different vowel. Again, in Deuteronomy 28, 27. And you shall become an astonishment, Shema, a proverb, Mashal, a byword, Shnina, which comes from the word for teeth that it's, it's just something sharp among all the nations, whither Yehovah shall lead you. Oh no, the word is Shama. What is that? That is the word Sham there with a directional hey suffix. Sometimes it's called a locative suffix. It looks exactly like the noun for astonishment. Are we confused? Yes, but we can be unconfused. We see we have the same problem in every language. We need to know the context, and then we can know what word we're looking at. Well, how are all these ideas tied together? What they have in common is breath. Breath as an indicator of the essence, of the character, of the place, or the person. So when we talk about a name, we don't just mean a name. And we've talked about that in plenty of places. For example, Joseph's name. He received that name because his mother named him that in the history of the development of the tribes. And she was barren and she finally had a son and she said, may God continue to add to me. But when he says his name to his brothers, he says, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. And in that we can hear so much more, we can hear I'm going to continue you because without me, you will die in the famine. Or I am going to gather you. And he did. He succeeded in gathering his family together. So we can see in the word Shem, it's more than just a name of something. It has a meaning. It has a character of who that person is. A place has a character. There's something about it that strikes us in a certain way. When we see a place of desolation, we can imagine perhaps that the wind has blown through it and blown all the greenery and the usefulness away from it. And it's also a place that takes our breath away. You look at it and you go, oh, that happened here. So that is how these things are tied together. And there's one more word that really expresses that idea, and that word is shum. It's only used once in Tanakh, in Numbers 11.5. We remembered the fish, which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Shum is garlic, even to this day in modern Hebrew. And it has a very specific breath about it, if we can say that. The smell is distinctive and it identifies that thing. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below the video. 
In the meantime, until next time, Tasimit Ha'inayim Al Hashemayim. Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.